This is M.G. Ajam, Scientific Secretary of Bangladesh Society of Cardiovascular Intervention. Welcome to all the scientific session. This is our day two session. This is our first session, virtual session. Mostly from our foreign faculty will give their talk. Now I'm requesting Dr. Timothy D. Henry. He is the past president of Sky. And he will talk on cardiovascular complications of COVID-19, direct and indirect with instance from neck mitral. I am requesting Dr. Timothy D. Henry, please. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Henry. I'm an interventional cardiologist, and I'm coming to you today from Cincinnati, Ohio, at the Christ Hospital. And I am the uh, president of SKY, uh, Society of Coronary Angiography and Intervention. And I wish I was there uh, with you in person. But what I'd like to do is start about the cardiovascular complications of COVID-19, both the direct and the indirect effects. And this actually comes, this is an overview that comes from a paper that we had in the European Heart Journal in last fall that really, I think, outlines both the direct effects and indirects, and we're gonna go through those in some detail. So what about the background? What about COVID-19? This is a picture of the virus. Um, it actually looks pretty, unfortunately, uh, never before in our life has there been something that disrupted the world as much as COVID-19. And one of the key parts of the, the virus is the way that it enters the cell. And it does that by using the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor which is highly expressed in the heart and on endothelia throughout the body. And so it enters uh, through the respiratory epithelial cells, but there is a tremendous impact on cardiovascular tissues throughout. Now, when you look at symptoms, symptoms have been very broad and they vary and they've changed as we do the variants. You have fever, loss of taste and smell, lots of pulmonary symptoms, including pneumonia, but cardiovascular symptoms are really are also common. And then you have GI symptoms. So it really it can present many ways, including asymptomatic. What about the markers? And I think the most important one is troponin. A patient's hospitalized, 15 to 40% of patients will have an elevated troponin. It's also patient, you have an elevated D-dimer, which is uh, especially, especially with thrombotic complications. You have an increased inflammatory markers, including CRP and IL-6. This is a really important slide that shows that patients with cardiovascular disease have almost a four times higher uh, incidence of mortality. Likewise, patients with hypertension and diabetes are at increased risk. So the combination of uh, elevated troponin and a history of cardiovascular disease puts you at very high risk. And this is an early uh, slide from China, but it showed that if you have both cardiovascular disease and a positive troponin, you have about a 70% <clears throat> mortality. If you have just a positive troponin, it was about 40%. Now it's improved some since then, um, but uh, it still points out that the combination is bad and the elevated troponin is, hot, is high. Now, what about the cardiovascular manifestations? This is a very nice slide that really illustrates those manifestations. And number one, the reasons for the elevated troponin are many. You can have a type 1 MI with plaque rupture and an occluded coronary, a standard uh, ST elevation MI. You can also have type 2 MIs due to the mismatch, and that pulmonary emboli or a DVT. And this illustrates the microthrombi. And what you see is in capillaries, really in the pulmonary bed, in the kidneys, and in the myocardium, you have microthrombi. And that can lead to patients presenting with ST elevation and slow flow. Now, <clears throat> we're going to shift and actually talk a little bit about ST elevation right now. There is very many much effect on ST elevation throughout the world. And what we noticed in the United States very early in March of 2020 is there was a 40% reduction in patients coming to the hospital with ST elevation MI. And that's not because they weren't having things, but patients were scared thing that we saw on social media or on Twitter 
was that patients were coming in the hospital with ST elevation, but when you did the angiogram, there was no clear culprit. And there's many things that could cause this, but we know that the incidence of that in COVID is about 25 to 30 percent, and I'm going to talk about that. And it's very difficult to look at these two and say which one has ST elevation from a STEMI and which one does not. And it, I think it's very difficult to know. So there was also early on a report of STEMI and how the high mortality. And so what we did is we actually developed the North American COVID MI <clears throat> registry. And this is now the largest registry in the United States, or in the United States, largest registry in the world for COVID positive patients. And uh, there were some key things that we noted. There was a more frequent in-hospital presentation, more frequent thrombotic lesions, more frequent no culprit. There was higher mortality, but there was a lot of controversy on how to treat these people. And we know, <clears throat> from data that people came in with heart attacks, they had more thrombotic lesions, more stent thrombosis, more multivessel, more higher grade thrombus. Now, <clears throat> in terms of the impact on M, the mortality was 32%. So in summary, they occurred more frequently in non-white patients. It was more likely to present with cardiogenic shock and he had a much higher mortality. So this is a really important registry. We keep going. We now have about 15 publications that have come from that. We're looking at why about race. We're doing an angiographic core lab. We're doing an EKG core lab. And really what we found is primary PCI is the preferable choice. Um, so what about the unintended consequences? This is very important. So when they told people when they had the lockdowns and they told people to stay home, there was a reduction in the number of patients coming to the emergency room. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice. There was a reduction of patients coming to the emergency rooms and there was a reduction in the STEMI application. What did that, what happened with that? So what you saw was a marked increase in complications related to myocardial infarction, not from COVID, just from myocardial infarction. Guy, we did a survey and we said, my, and what we emphasize, and I think a take home point is, if you have an ST elevation MI, just like other times, in non-COVID, you need to go to the hospital and have primary PCI. So what we did with the crisis in Sky, we really worked on public relations to get people to come to the hospital quickly, uh, even though it's safe to be in the hospital and we'll take good care of you. And it really made a difference. We called it the second still count. But I think it's important in, in all parts of the world to assure people that we can do good care even during the pandemic. So with that, I'll say, oh, Lord, here come circumstances beyond our control. And I'd say that's not true. We now have vaccines, we have good treatments, and we can actually care for people with um, um, the, uh, COVID, both with and also patients without. So I appreciate being here. It delighted to talk to you. I wish I was there in person, um, but I hope your meeting is outstanding. And we at Sky are very supportive of you in Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry, for your brilliant presentation. Now we are moving for next talk. Professor Dr. Ramesh Dugabuti. All of you know he is uh, the clinical professor of West Virginia Medical University and he is a program director of TAVAR and now we are happy to have him in virtually for our program. Now he will give a talk on reversal strategy in cardiogenic shock. Uh, moreover, I have, to say, I have to say he is the uh, international program director for the SKY committee. So I am requesting Dr. Dagawati, please share your screen. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azam, Dr. Rahman, uh, Dr. Mircea Malutin, and, uh, and the great uh, professors, Dr. Malik, as well. 
Uh, it's my great pleasure to join with you today. I have no disclosures. So let me start off with the 60-year-old man with hypertension, cardiac arrest at home, return of spontaneous circulation after one round of AP and uh, CPR, and pH is 7.2. As uh, Dr. Henry showed, this is another EKG that shows the diffuse ST depression, AVR, uh, lead AVL, ST elevations. And uh, what is the next best step? I think uh, cardiac cath, uh, medical therapy, hypothermia, and probably all of the above are correct answers depending upon uh, uh, the patient's neurological status. So he went for a cardiac cath, and uh, here is a, there's a complete occlusion of the proximal LAD, as well as a very small uh, circumflex branch, and uh, but RCA has significant uh, lesions as well. So now what uh, should we do? You know, you look at this LV gram, and it is a really uh, very uh, severely LV systolic dysfunction it can be seen and the EF is about 30 percent. Uh, balloon pump, impella, ECMO, all of the above, none, just inotropes. Any of these answers may be correct depending upon which study you want to quote and, uh, and uh, move towards that. You know. So uh, in our center we have impella, so we put an impella in, we opened up that uh, proximal LED and uh, that uh, has uh, at least a Timitri flow in the LAD and the RCA also was intervened. And uh, as you can see that this patient remained in uh, cardiogenic shock. And in follow-up, uh, however, patient remained hypotensive on uh, impeller, so VA ECMO was placed. And then he was uh, given high dose DOPA, AP, NOR-AP, amiodarone, and uh, he developed renal failure, remained acidotic, developed ischemic leg from the ECMO, transferred for heart transplant, and at the transplant center, he was re-evaluated and made comfort care and he died three days after cardiac arrest. So this is another patient, a 47-year-old woman, diabetes, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome on uh, rivaroxaban. Uh, came in with anterolateral MI, loaded with ticagrelor, primary angioplasty was done, LAD stent and the TIMI3 flow was established. However, one hour later, VFib arrest refractory to DC shocks and the ongoing CPR and uh, Lucas, the autopulse was initiated and brought to the uh, cath lab back. And uh, here you can see LAD is completely occluded, the heart is barely moving, there's no flow in the coronaries. So multiple shocks, the VFib, then Econo, asystole and uh, Lucas was uh, positioned and the uh, patient uh, then underwent uh, ECMO. And uh, as you can see the flow is being established with the uh, balloon angioplasty and, uh, and the stent which was there, it looks un, uh, uh, you know, underdeployed. And so that was post dilated a little bit and uh, Timmy 3 flow, 2 to 3 flow was established. Uh, poor flows on ECMO, the venous cannula was repositioned. And uh, here's the clinical progress from day 1 to 22, but uh, she survived. Uh, no or minimal contractility on uh, echo and day two she developed acute kidney injury, liver injury and uh, some contractility was noted on day three, she was decannulated on day five and then transferred to balloon pump and uh, some distal embolic events were noted in the foot and day 22 she was discharged with full neurological recovery, LV function improved to 40 percent. So I think these two patients are slightly different, one came in uh, with uh, from home as a cardiac arrest, the other one actually post MI went yeah, into yeah. cardiac arrest after one hour. So the definition of cardiogenic shock is always uh, difficult uh, in a certain state, but the sky made a now uh, uh, with the multiple disciplinaries coming together, they uh, finalized the diagnosis. Persistence of solid blood pressure less than 90, not responding to fluid administration alone, secondary to cardiac dysfunction associated with signs of hyperperfusion with a cardiac index less than 2.2 liters per minute per square meter and a wedge more than 15 millimeters of mercury. But however, shock is variable depending upon the studies that you look at. Impress trial had actually majority of them are cardiac arrest, 90 percent of cardiac arrest patients and uh, lactate is between 7 to 8 and the pH is 7.1 to 7.2. Balloon pump shock 2 trial actually had a uh, uh, lactate is only more than two and uh, many of them uh, did not have uh, any cardiac arrest at all and uh, uh, signs of hypoperfusion were noted. So obviously one side does not fit all, we need to have a common language and hence the sky uh, stages of cardiogenic shock actually uh, made it uh, simpler for us uh, to come to a common uh, uh, phrase that we use. So people can be at risk for cardiogenic shock with anybody with hypertension, cardiac disease, 
prior MI, all of them are at risk for secondary infarction and cardiogenic shock. But uh, this uh, first is a beginning of cardiogenic shock where the people start actually a relative hypotension or tachycardia without hyperperfusion. Uh, identifying the, the patients at this point of time and maybe using gynotropes might help at this stage. And uh, but in stage C, D and E shock which is classic deteriorating or extremist meaning cardiac arrest uh, uh, patients uh, as I showed you. And all of these can actually get a modifier of cardiac arrest as, uh, as shown here uh, that actually makes the outcomes worse. So, as we go from C to E, the mortality increases and uh, the number of devices that we use also uh, increase, the number of medications that we use also increase. So, the the most important clinical findings as you see in uh, D shock is they are already uh, cold, clammy and, uh, and it is very difficult to maintain their uh, perfusion and uh, in uh, extremis obviously they are requiring multiple devices and uh, such as Intel and ECMO or something. Maybe there is a use for balloon pump on stage B or a C, early C shock, you know. I don't, so I think uh, this is where we, uh, people say that the balloon pump is of no use or impella is of no use or uh, ECMO is of no use, but uh, where is the patient in this uh, 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 pyramid is very important. However, the therapeutic goal of acute MI and cardiogenic shock are stabilizing the patient and uh, number two is actually reperfuse the patient as soon as possible and uh, minimize the uh, stunning, uh, however we can do that uh, whether it is uh, stopping myocardial injury, restoring the normal myocardial metabolism, reperfusion injury can be prevented and enhancing myocyte recovery. So, this is a mechanical unloading and infarct size, if you do an unload with an, uh, any sort of mechanical circulatory support, the infarct size can come down from 50 percent or 56 percent to about uh, 28 percent as uh, seen in this uh, clear, clear pictures. The pulmonary artery catheter by this uh, Dr. Gidwani's paper, everybody said initially that there is no use of uh, uh, PA catheter, but it has been shown that it is definitely indicated in patients with cardiogenic shock during supportive therapy and uh, indicated in patients with discordant right and left ventricular failure and chronic heart failure. So, there is definitely a need. And uh, why is uh, uh, LV load bad, meaning if there is elevated end diastolic pressure as you can see here, uh, the cumulative mortality in can be about uh, 8 to 8 percent or so in the same group of STEMI population. But in the, if they do not have a EDP, uh, if EDP is less than 12, the mortality comes down to about 2.5 to 3 percent, which is significant. And uh, so, who are the patients who should be given acute uh, mechanical circulatory support is uh, uh, anybody with cardiogenic uh, acute uh, ST elevation MI and cardiogenic shock may benefit uh, to have a pre-PCI uh, impella in this uh, National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative uh, looked at it and uh, if you um, put a uh, impella prior to PCI, your survival is about 70 percent compared to maybe about 45 percent with the post-PCI impella. So, definitely there is an improvement in the, that trial. But then shock confused us saying that immediate multivessel PCI carries a higher mortality uh, uh, to 55 compared to culprit lesion alone PCI. Uh, so, all cause mortality is given here 51 percent in the immediate multivessel PCI, culprit lesion only PCI is 43 percent at 30 days. And so, this made the guidelines in European cardio ESC STEMI guidelines moved uh, uh, from 2017 uh, uh, 2A to uh, uh, class 3, you know. So, the, the immediate multivessel PCI is not recommended uh, by uh, European Society of Cardiology. Even one year, the mortality is still in favor of uh, culprit uh, uh, lesion only PCI actually. Uh, but you look at the re repeat uh, revascularizations, they are much higher. Uh, at 32.3 percent in culprit lesion only PCI as compared to immediate multivessel PCI. So, even though they do not need a PCI at the time, later on they might have needed it. Uh, in the national uh, cardiac uh, and national CSI algorithm from United States looking at about 80 centers from 29 states and enrolling about 400 patients and rapid identification of cardiogenic shock, cath lab activation, femoral access confirm acute MI and cardiogenic shock 
and uh, with the left heart cath, right heart cath, echocardiogram as needed to confirm the diagnosis and placing a mechanical circulatory support. The whole strategy is depending upon door to support time with a target of less than 90 minutes, not to door to balloon time. So the mechanical circulatory support, once it is placed, then you proceed with PCI and uh, based on right heart cath, whether you need a LV support or RV support can be determined based on the uh, uh, PAPI pressures as well. And once if it is a cardiac power output is more than 0.6, continue to titrate down the pressures and inotropes. So uh, with this type of uh, uh, definite algorithm, they showed that actually uh, in all uh, uh, cardiogenic shock patients, C, D and E were included, uh, at 71% uh, of the patients were able to be discharged and uh, definitely 53% uh, remained uh, to survive uh, at one year as well. So. And how does this uh, National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative uh, from United States uh, compare to other uh, trials here? Let us take culprit shock which is here. In culprit shock actually 54 percent of them are cardiac arrest and 46 percent of them are cardiac arrest in National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative. And the 30 day survival in culprit shock was only 49 percent whereas 68 percent survived in National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative. So the danger trial which is the Danish German cardiogenic shock trial is still ongoing, we will wait for those results. So a 30 day survival rate from two decades of cardiogenic shock trial showed that uh, uh, compared to that national uh, cardiogenic shock uh, C and D and all comers did much better than IABP shock 2 trials, culprit shock trials or medical therapy in the shock trial itself. You know. So from the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative is the largest prospective North American cardiogenic shock study in the past two decades recruited the sickest cohort and uh, who are unlikely to be recruited into any randomized controlled trial. Still the uh, survival of 77 percent at 30 days was uh, much better in the stage C and D shock. And uh, obviously these patients uh, did not have a, uh, 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 did unfortunately did not have a, a survival up to one year which is not really great. But uh, that guy tells us that there may be guideline directed medical therapy is still required in these patients and further randomized control trials such as RECOVER4 is ongoing currently in the United States. So in summary, patients with acute myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, culprit lesion only PCI with possible staged revascularization compared with immediate multivessel PCI is associated with a reduction in all cause death or renal replacement therapy at 30 days as shown in culprit shock trial. This effect in the composite endpoint is persistently observed at 12 months follow up. So I, the 30 day difference in all cause mortality is attenuated over time. However, there is no increase in mortality after 30 days until one year follow up. So right now I think culprit lesion only PCI at the time of cardiogenic shock is a good strategy followed by pre-discharge PCI of the non-culprit vessel is the, probably the best uh, strategy for uh, these patients. So I think in dealing with advanced cardiogenic shock patients in the current era of mechanical circulatory support. An appropriate device and patient selection algorithm should be applied to improve clinical outcomes and optimize utilization of resources in your particular institutions. If you do not have uh, impeller, please use balloon pump and uh, ECMO. I do not think that there is anything wrong with that. You know, I do not think we can just say that uh, okay, you do not know how to use but you still have to use is something I think a foolish to recommend. So use the resources available to you. Thank you very much. I'll stop here. Thank you, Ramesh. Nicely in uh, discussion on critical issue of reverse studies in cardiogenic shock. We are really happy. But one thing all of you know, the shocking news of the shock is despite all modalities, most of the patients are died at the end of the one years, as you say, uh, showed nicely. But our problem is that in especially less facilities countries like Bangladesh, we don't have enough MCS support. So, can you give any recommendation or suggestion actually how we can tackle in this situation? Yeah, uh, very good question Dr. Azam. I think uh, as I mentioned clearly that uh, uh, depending upon balloon pump and uh, ECMO which is much uh, cheaper in countries like India and Bangladesh uh, is not uh, a, a, a bad uh, uh, tool at all. I would recommend that. Uh, placement of a, a, a balloon pump as early as possible, I think uh, maybe in people who are slightly showing signs of uh, shock, classic shock, such as in stage B shock is probably 
good enough to somehow reverse the uh, spiraling down of uh, cardiogenic shock. But uh, once they go into stage C and D shock, maybe adding ECMO to the balloon pump will be good. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Thank now you. it's my honor and privilege to introduce in the screen our Professor Chudra Hafizul Aosan, M.S. Hiramat sir, and also Professor Martin Khan. Very, very good morning in Bangladesh and from good, very late good evening from U.S. So, we are really happy to have you in person as well as virtually. So, now, uh, would you like to any, any make comment from uh, um, Dr. Karan uh, regarding this issue? Yes. So, I mean, I, I think the issue is well stated, well, well identified. One controversy remains is should we institute support prior to PCI, right? Reperfusion first, then support, or support, then perfusion? My bias says support first, because if they're in shock, you got to stabilize them, put your PA catheter in, give your fluids, give your pressors, and then go ahead and open the artery. Otherwise, you may open an artery that doesn't have enough perfusion pressure. It won't stay open. What's your thought? Absolutely, Martin. I think uh, we looked at this uh, particular issue in our institution as well. Uh, putting in a catheter, PA catheter, and a mechanical circulatory support, and uh, then PCI, and within half an hour, if the hemodynamics do not improve, uh, we would then escalate. Yes. So, uh, like, um, we defined as mild, moderate, and severe, but it is B and C and D and E shock. If the patient is in B, he can get a balloon pump and a swan, but the hemodynamics have to improve with revascularization. If not, he will be upgraded to an impella. And if he doesn't improve on impeller CP catheter, he would either get a, a, a surgical consult with the, to do a impeller 50 or 5.5 nowadays from the uh, axillary, or actually go for a ECMO. I think this is an early initiation and continuation of mechanical circulatory support early on. I think is very important before PCI because. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, reperfusion injury can be prevented, I think, in, uh, by unloading the left ventricle. Mm -hmm. Namesh, I think it is probably important to recognize early on that what kind of uh, shock we are dealing with, not only the stages, but the underlying mechanism. Is it yeah. predominantly RV issue or LV issue or mechanical complications? That helps. So I think uh, bedside echo, quick handled echo may be helpful. And also, just at least check the end diastolic pressure as you uh, are in the cath lab. It, it gives you a lot of information um, and, and let you help to decide which way to go. And, and also the EKG, where is the infarcturated artery? Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Hafiz. Uh, just now I have one more patient in the hospital who had a PCI in our, uh, in our uh, uh, referring hospital and was sent to us uh, with the uh, uh, cardiogenic shock and he's uh, probably, even though we put an impeller and we did uh, other non-culprit vessels, he might still die because he did not have a pre-PCI impeller or a balloon pump, you know. Yeah. Thank you, I Dr. Ramesh. I still tell my fellows that you'll be crucified if you don't do hemodynamics by uh, Martin. <laughs> yeah. No, okay. absolutely. Okay. Dr. Nuralum, would you like to any, any comment? Thank you, uh, Dr. Ramesh. Just, I would like to know, uh, in, uh, you have shown very nice data, uh, National uh, Cardiogenic Shock Initiative. May I know how many patients uh, of this registry or data required circulatory supports? Uh, 406 patients in the trial from about uh, 29 states. And uh, uh, all of the patients, which stages are more prevalent among those patients? Stages A, B, C, D you have mentioned. Which stages yeah. patients are more in your uh, NCSI? Uh, yes, yeah, stage uh, C and uh, D were combined together, so they were the most uh, numbers. Hello? Okay. Hello, Mr. okay. I'm, I'm still, Thank uh, you. Should, should like you move the next you, speaker? If you like uh, LAD is the culprit and you correct the LAD lesion, uh, and then you have a very simple lesion in a very, very dominant right coronary artery. Does it make sense to address the right if you're almost sure that in 10 minutes you can finish up the right, it's a type A lesion? Or would you still like to wait and uh, see the heart struggle and then bring him back? I, I, I mean, I, with the culprit shock, 
trial, which we it opened our eyes as well, is that if it is a TIMI3 flow and 90% discrete lesion, as a juicy and low hanging fruit as it appears, uh, we should leave it alone. Bring him back maybe after two days or three days when he has uh, stabilized a little bit more. And I think this is uh, uh, what actually the trial has been talking about because some maybe some patients, it might be just in the you know, five or ten patients in the entire trial where they had uh, unfortunate events uh, with the non-culprit PCI that actually changed the whole game of the study. So I would recommend that uh, if it is uh, stable, maybe leave it alone. And uh, Morton, uh, Mort, we talked about non-culprit, uh, what is the significance by FFR and IFR and you know, so I think there's a lot of value to it, which we think that we should do it. No, no I'm not talking of borderline lesion which need it. I'm talking of a simple, you see, 99% additional lesion in a very dominant request. Right? Okay, thank you very much. Part now part we are moving for the next speaker. Now I'm requesting yeah. Professor Chaudhary H. Hafizul Aosan, please get ready. Before getting ready, his slide, I am just give a short introduction of the Dr. Hafizul Aosan. He is the Chief of Cardiology and Director of the Cardiology Fellowship Program, University Medical Center, Las Vegas, Nevada. And currently, he is the Governor of Nevada Chapter of American College of Cardiology. He has published several books, especially in the COVID era. He published a special book, COVID-19 Companion Handbook. It is already well circulated in Bangladesh <coughs> as well as in the US. Now, I am requesting Dr. Chaudhuri Hafizul Aosan, please share your screen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Nice to see familiar faces, and uh, I really thank uh, the organizers and Bangladesh Society of Cardiovascular Intervention for the invitation. So uh, I was given the responsibility of uh, talking on plaque modification. So as we deal with the coronary angiography and intervention, we are faced with this challenge when there is this calcific and fibrocalcific lesions. Some of these can be superficial, some deep, and then we look at this calcium, and that causes the problem of not only the delivery of the stent, also the deployment of the stent to the optimal. And it does matter. Because when there is this tough lesions, there is possibility of dissection. And uh, sometimes the balloon, we call it the dog bone, and then there is a problem with the stent expansion. And then uh, there is also the problem in the drug eluting era, the drug distribution, and uh, all these can lead to subsequent consequences of stent restenosis and can give higher stent thrombosis. We are doing a lot more CT angiogram, and if uh, you are doing, then you can probably utilize these images to decide about your uh, intervention planning. We actually use this quite a, f a good number of patients, and we look at the uh, pictures so we can uh, have some idea that what will be the strategy in terms of um, PTCA and uh, deployment of the stent. So we have several tools and uh, we can use the high pressure non-compliant balloon and in, we can use the scoring balloon and we can also use the um, plaque modification by different uh, technology such as uh, the rotational atherectomy, orbital atherectomy, and now the uh, coronary lithotripsy or uh, intravascular uh, lithotripsy. So this is a sort of a basic that we learned during our training that you can see coronary calcification, but there are more into it because the lesions can be long, tortuous, the lesions can be on the way. So classic teaching is that prepare the vessel and assess the vessel uh, and the lesion. Uh, not only the lesion, also the uh, vessel before the lesion, because that can be on the way for um, 
the delivery of the uh, devices. One thing uh, is this vast majority of the, the cases with coronary calcification. This is basically dystrophic calcification. And I deal with a lot of uh, renal patients. And in some cases, it's possible that there is some uh, metastatic calcification as well. But the important thing is that sometimes we may not be able to realize the extensive calcification by just angiography alone. And we may need to have other imaging devices to evaluate and then make a plan. So for procedural success, we need to evaluate, we need to prepare to get the best result. So balloon alone may not be good. You may have other tools and it is important to have these tools because you know, maybe up to 15, 20% of your cases, there may be uh, a requirement for plaque modification. But why does it matter? If you look at this minimum stent area and if someone achieving this area less than 5.5, the, there is higher event rate. We know this from the Excel trial. And then if you look at this, that the TVR, TLR, all this uh, actually has important sig significance. And it reminds me of Greg Fonero's paper on heart failure. If there is a recurrence in heart failure, hospitalization, it actually results in higher mortality. And this is paper from 2019. Those who had repeat revascularization for any cause ultimately had a higher death rate. So it is not a simple thing. We need to prevent every way we can so that we don't encounter the repeat revascularization. And what it means for the optimal PCI. It means that the gain in the stented area, and if you look at this, the higher the stent area, the lower the event rate, the lower the target vessel failure. And there are many ways you can look at this uh, definitions of minimum stent area. This is a nice paper that describes this. But if you look at the absolute number of 5.5 or higher, the event rate is lower, but also you can look at the, the minimum stent area over vessel area. And if it is over 38.9, roughly say more than 40%, your clinical driven TLR, stent thrombosis, are actually significantly lower in that group. So we should do everything to modify the plaque and achieve the optimal PCI result. And you can test that after by imaging. You can assess that before uh, doing the procedure by imaging. Or if you don't have imaging, I would request that it doesn't hurt to share the angiography with experienced operators and get their opinion before you go into a procedure where you think that black modification is important to, to have. And these are the tools that we have. And I think it is good to have all the tools. I have not seen any study comparing rota versus orbital atherectomy versus IVL. But I can tell you the vast majority of the time, it, you can probably do it one of these plaque modification technique. Here is one significant left main distal. You can see bad calcification, dominant left main, high risk PCI, and uh, the surgeons turned down because of the issues with the uh, pulmonary. Uh, the, uh, we use this uh, impella, the support, and then uh, modified the plaque, and then uh, we then did the uh, distal bifurcation technique um, with the uh, uh, dual stent strategy and good results. And patient was uh, eventually angina free. This patient actually uh, was getting angina while he was feeding his horses and uh, reported back saying that now it is nice to be angina free. Now we talk about the shock wave. This is a fairly recent technology and we can look at this. 
Um, we have one case here that um, uh, we we uh, we saw that there's osteal uh, LAD, and uh, we uh, we thought that um, there is also a subsequent lesion in the prox LAD, and I honestly thought that uh, the RCA was a CTO, and uh, if we can um, offer the patient uh, revascularization. We often say about heart team approach, but the uh, surgeon uh, says this is high risk, and we use the uh, shock wave. And I had uh, the rota backup, but we did not need it. We then used the balloons uh, after this, and then we are able to uh, deploy this tent uh, fairly easily, and they got a good result. So. Um, if we look at the disrupt CAD and disrupt CAD two trials, there is a fairly high uh, success rate, and the MACE was comparable, and uh, uh, the learning curve for the uh, shock wave is almost uh, uh, zero. Uh, you can learn it very quickly, but I think it is important that we need to be um, careful that we have backup other modification techniques in case that doesn't work. And uh, the uh, fairly uh, uh, comparable uh, complications and probably I, I would say the perforations is less and bloody arrhythmias and the requirement for temporary pacer far less in the shockwave um, group. Um, so um, assess the lesion, plaque modification helps optimal PCI. And yes, optimal PCI does matter, plan ahead, Imaging is the key, and in resource uh, strained uh, area, the angiographic experience and experience from others. Um, and I always tell my fellows, if you're in the interventional cardiology, first thing you do is throw away the ego, try to learn, do as best as you can, and, and know better. And when you know better, do better. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chaudhary Hafizul Alsar for your brilliant presentation, plaque modification really in very tough in our daily practice. But though we have some important tools in our practice, would you like to comment any Shonjog regarding this point? Um, hi, Chaudhary, it's nice to see you. It was a great yeah. talk. Um, I, I'd love some guidance specifically on how you choose what therapy to use in calcified lesions when you need to modify plaque. Like what's your, what does your decision-making algorithm look like? Or, or what is the differentiating feature on some of these lesions that might steer you to IVL or to atherectomy or away from both? Yeah, so uh, one of the important things that I kind of started with that if the balloon does not go and the wire goes, and then I start with the rota bar and step bar. But lately we are trying the uh, IVL what we call the wood packing, and it worked. So I don't know, uh, we have a natural tendency to see whether we can get away with the shockwave, because many operators probably will be saying that, oh, rota if we can avoid. But um, in, in case of uh, long lesions and very high grade stenosis, where the balloon uh, does not go, it is very difficult to get a good result with the shock wave. But um, in, a, in, a, in a, our experience along uh, with the, uh, the bifurcating lesion, um, as another issue because if there is a true bifurcating lesion, both calcified, and you need to do both cal uh, calcified area rota on this vessel, rota on that vessel, you might be able to get away with the shock wave that is probably a advantage in uh, bifurcating lesion. Good evening and good morning both. From Bangladesh, good morning. And in your countries, good evening. So it is a well, good Bangladesh lesson and very, <laughs> very important for us, especially in Bangladesh. That we have uh, no, uh, all facilities of plaque modification in Bangladesh, especially most of the centers, you know it very well. So those centers, th those who have no IBL, Ruta, and others. What is your suggestion for plaque modification? I think I would uh, say the same way Ramesh mentioned that uh, if you, if knowing that there is trouble is actually an important thing. 
because I would probably be careful if I don't have the resources, then you know, we can try. In acute situation, is different. But if it is a stable coronary, then I would be careful and share with others that, okay, are you going to start? I was in a meeting with Dr. Paul Thirstein, and he says, okay, start with non-compliant balloon. That's your first initial you know, tool. Um, but the question is, we need to be careful that if that doesn't work, then what? Um, I actually had one case where one of my partners did in a surgery center, did not do it, he stopped. He did not uh, get into more complications and then sent to us uh, in the hospital. And then we did the uh, plaque modification and deployed this. Um, and sometimes it is important and Morton is here and I'm sure that you will be hearing from Morton that when you have a bifurcating lesion and then you have the compromise a little bit with the ostium, will you be okay with the, uh, with the physiologic assessment or you will be also doing the imaging. But we are using more often the physiologic wire. I actually leave the wire in the, in the circumflex while I'm doing the osteal LAD. And I check whether, when I'm inflating the balloon, whether the circumflex wire is getting any uh, uh, change in the IFR. That gives me much comfort that what's happening with the physiology. Okay. But it is tough, uh, it is tough that whether you can get away or not, when you don't have all the resources. Uh, I do agree with that. And, and, and I think Bangladesh, another important thing we should mention that if it is a bifurcating lesion and the left main distal and patient does one, this patient does one, that I think cost also is an important issue. Your cost for cabbage with an excellent outcome is far less than the uh, bypass surgery cost in the US. Thank you very much. Can thank I say, uh, can I add two sentences thank to you. that? Uh, Dr. Hassan Chowdhury, um, the center, you know, in many places, the center's capabilities vary from low activity to high activity. And I'm sure in Bangladesh, there are centers of complete function uh, that have every device, and there are other centers that have few devices. So part of the judgment and quality of care will be that in centers that don't have every capability, they have to decide when to go and when to stop rather than trying to be a hero. And that's a, sometimes a difficult problem because they feel, many of us, feel that we can do stuff that maybe we shouldn't be doing. Now, we're in a VA hospital and we're limited. We don't have surgery. So we don't take on things that are gonna put us in the operating room, and but we have every other capability. So just a suggestion, it's okay to transfer a patient to a higher level of care rather than jeopardize an outcome, especially with these severely calcified lesions where other things can make it work and our old ways don't work. And that coming from Morton means a lot. And I would request yes. the audience to pay attention to that. Okay, now I'm requesting Professor Mr. Jamaluddin. Would you like to comment? Uh, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chaudhary Hassan, uh, my friend. Uh, it's very important topics for all over the world, particularly for Bangladesh, uh, my usual idea is that whenever, balloon, whenever wire crossed, balloon is not crossed, then my play and interplay has been started. And at that moment, if I have no amazing facilities, it is very difficult in that situation. If the amazing facilities is there, I can uh, evaluate the uh, calcification, whether it is superficial calcification, deep calcification, whether I shall be able to do it with uh, rota or IVL, whatever it is essential. But if the um, imaging facility is not available, then is the problem. And in that situation, if balloon crosses and there is dog booning, I must have to say that stop the procedure if you have not uh, the ability of uh, plaque modification like um, rotablation or IVL. As because if I place a stent with dog booning, there must be uh, thrombosis or there will be early restenosis. And that is why in that case, we must have to ab abandon the procedure rather than doing uh, with the dog booning effect of the stent. Besides this, in our country, another uh, poor man's procedure, meaning that wire cut, uh, keeping one more wire into the uh, coronary artery 
and with the balloon inflation, high pressure balloon inflation, or it may be a cutting balloon, uh, we can uh, get sometimes a bit good result. And for a long calcified lesion, it is wise to do, uh, it is wise to do rota, and a uh, long uh, lesion may be calcified, uh, calcified long lesion, we can do also with IVL, if the balloon of the IVL crosses, as because IVL balloon has also a, a, a bit bulkier, we must have to prepare for that with the smaller balloon and then we can use the IVL. It's our uh, simple uh, experience. Thank you for your excellent uh, deliberation. Thank you, Chaudhary Havijal Asam, for your brilliant presentation. Now we are moving for the next talk. And before going to talk, uh, I just give a small introduction to Professor Dr. Morton Karn. All of you know he's, he has outstanding contribution to develop the inter interventional field of cardiology. And currently, he is the Chief of Cardiology, Veterans Administration, Long Beach Healthcare System, and a staff interventional cardiologist. He is a professor of medicine, University of California, Irwin, in the Division of Cardiology. And Dr. Khan is a past president of Sky. Society of Coronary Angiographic and Intervention and continues to serve many national and industrial cardiovascular societies. That's why today he is here with us to teach us, to give his thoughts, and definitely we believe we will learn something from him. And all of you know he is he holds fellowship in American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and Master Fellow of the Society for Coronary Angiographic and Intervention. And all of you know he has outstanding contribution in the uh, field of intervention cardiology. He published several books. I believe all of the in front of my, in this conference, all of the participants may, I believe, gone through your books, especially in Karn's Cardiac Catheterization Handbooks. Now it is probably in seventh edition is published in market. And he also, uh, write, uh, write a in wonderful book, the International Cardiac Cath Handbook, fourth edition is still in mar available in market. So these books are among the most widely used textbooks, most nationally and internationally, to train our physicians. So I believe uh, we will enjoy your session. Now he will give talk on update on clinical conundrum of coronary physiology, which is very important in our daily practice to make our decision perfect. Thank you for this kind invitation to contribute to your wonderful interventional meeting. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan, and thank you, Dr. Azkem, uh, for inviting me. So I want to talk a little bit of higher level coronary physiology than you may be uh, used to hearing. So this is going to be not the beginner's course. I have these disclosures to make. They're companies that make pressure wires and pressure measuring systems. And I just want to remind you that uh, we have this wonderful array of um, options, options to, um, I just want to keep this thing, options to make decisions about how to treat lesions. In the beginner course, we tell you the angiogram is not always reliable, especially for intermediate lesions. We tell you that physiology, especially FFR or IFR, can identify lesions that need treatment. And I'm going to highlight for you, not the basics, not how to do it, but some of the conundrums, the difficulties in applying these in daily practice. So I just want to review quickly here. Before you come to the cath lab, you're doing physiology. You're doing a lot of stress testing. You're doing other kinds of things. But there are angiographically derived FFR systems available, perhaps not everywhere. And part of the issue is some financial problems. But the FFR CT is a very good tool. The, in the cath lab, you have a whole variety of, of wire-based interventions, and soon you'll have a variety of angiographically derived FFR without guide wire, which will give you a very close approximation. I'll touch on this again at the end. But if you don't like FFR because you don't like hyperemia, well, look at all of the resting ratios you have to choose from. And on the bottom, that yellow bar tells us where we're going to be going next. Patients who come to your laboratories, I'm sure you've seen them, they have normal arteries. How do you explain their chest pain? And one way is to check their microcirculation. That's not a conundrum yet because it's not as widely studied, but one day it will be. So let me just move forward through here. There's always a delay in my first slides. I have no idea why, but I'm gonna try and figure it out. 
So let me keep pushing buttons until something happens. Here we go. So I picked five conundrums. That is difficult problems encountered frequently. What do you do? What do you do when your resting ratio and your hyperemic ratio are at odds with one another? What do you do if you have more disease in the LED and you're worried about a proximal left main? Can I use the circumflex? What do you do about the non-infarct related artery physiology? Can I trust it? What do you do about diffuse disease and focal disease? Do you know when you're finished doing your procedure? And I'm gonna skip over TAVR and uh, coronary physiology because it's a topic all to itself. So let's just start with conundrum number one. Now, I wanna show you this angiogram, which looks to everybody, myself included, as a severe lesion. The FFR was 0.8, which is a borderline, but the IFR, in this case, non hyperemic pressure ratio was 0.94, which is cold normal. Now, this man had a high LVDP, but nonetheless, there is a significant visual functional mismatch. Most people would not bother to, to measure this, but in the other view, the lesion was not as severe. So we're gonna talk about why this happens, but I want you to recognize that not every severe lesion is physiologically severe, and not every mild lesion is physiologically negative. Okay, so conundrum number two is, what do I do when one is normal and one is abnormal? And let me see if I can walk you through this. Three things to remember about discordant physiology. First of all, you gotta ask the question is, why are you measuring both? If you believe in FFR, use FFR. You don't need IFR. If you believe in IFR, then use IFR and you don't need FFR. Now, if you're at the border zone, which is where most of these discordant values taken and you've decided to do one or the other to see if you're concordant, that's okay. But you have to recognize the question is, who do you trust? Now, the discordance is related to a couple of different things, but mostly it's related to a flow response. Higher flow produces high um, uh, values in, in flow and big gradients. And so you may get a positive FFR when you have a, a normal resting ratio. And lastly, you have to be sure you're not, you didn't introduce a technical error, which would produce a discordant result. Now I mentioned flow reserve. So if you look on this graph, along the bottom is coronary flow reserve. There's a resting point and then a hyperemic point. In severe lesions in the red, it goes from a resting ratio of 0.83 up to 0.73 with hyperemia. Coronary flow reserve is relatively low. This is a severe lesion, mostly, um, related to stenosis, but not always. Now on the bottom is a normal IFR in a mild lesion where you can go from 0.93 all the way down to 0.73, and that's positive. Now, the question here is, is three times increase in flow sufficient to produce a better, I mean, a, a stent would produce better flow? And the answer is probably not, but it's unknown. It was tested in the defined flow study and found to be pressure was more uh, associated with results, whereas in the defined flare study and in the uh, ice, the uh, ice study, there was uh, a favorable response treating coronary flow reserve. So the issue is not quite settled, but I think if you have discordance and a very large separation between rest and FFR going down to 0.8 all the way from normal, that is probably representative of very high flow, and you could make a more conservative decision in that individual. Lesion configurations also produce discordance. Diffuse disease shown on the left affects the uh, coefficient of friction and <coughs> excuse me, produces a uh, negative FFR, but a positive IFR. It's associated with diffuse disease on pullback, as you can see by that blue line, as it is pressure recovery over the course of the vessel. On the other hand, a focal gradient, focal lesion, often has a focal gradient. And in those cases, the FR is more often positive and the IFR is more often negative, very similar to the case we just saw. So these are contributors to the discordance between these two values. And here's the statistics go along with it, and Warasaro. Okay, so for our first conundrum, what do you do about it? Well, you have to take a stepwise approach. Who did you trust the first time? Because you pulled out a second measurement. And of course, in stable ischemic heart disease, all the values hold. We're gonna talk about acute coronary syndrome in just a moment. 
And then I want you to remember what we talked about regarding coronary flow reserve. Okay, let's go to left main. Critical lesion can be eccentric, often looks like a football. Is flow limited when, the, when it is an 80% stenosis in one view and a 30% stenosis in the orthogonal view? I don't know. And that's why physiology is critically important for patients with left main stenoses in many cases, especially those who are asymptomatic. This was one of my very first left main that we did FFR in. I was certain this was gonna be positive and I was delighted that it was a negative value. Okay, we know that if we use thresholds of FFR at 0.8 and threshold of 0.89 for the IFR, if you follow the rules and defer treatment when they're normal, the patients do very well, just as well as if you revascularize them. So there's no reason to send them to surgery if they have normal physiology. Now, how do you manage downstream disease? When there's an LAD present, as in the top image, and you have an intermediate left main, and you measure the FFR, you can measure it across the LAD and get a number. And when you measure it again in the circumflex to try and assess the left main, you will have a different value. If you should increase the flow through the LAD by putting a stent in the LAD, now more flow goes through the left main and all of a sudden the negative, C, uh, negative FFR in the left main measure initially becomes positive and now you have to treat that unprotected left main. Some people don't mind that, others are a little concerned about treating left mains. Let's look again at the experiment that showed this was true. Bill Furon and his colleagues created a model in patients who had LED stenosis. So they put a stent and they put a balloon in the stent, and then they put a second balloon catheter into the left main, deflated, you can see it sitting there, and over both balloons, over each balloon, was a pressure guide wire. So then we know that the bed in the LAD, shown at the top with its uh, FFR, and the bed in the circumflex shown at the bottom uh, with its arrow pointing to the lower end, and if you look at what happens as we increase the gradient across the LAD and it becomes worse and worse and worse, the bed is diminished, the FFR gets worse because of the pressure gradient, but the flow to the circumflex is reduced. And so the FFR goes up. And so you get a falsely elevated left main FFR. I'm gonna go back for just a second. Trace the yellow line at the top, that's the FFR as it goes down with balloon inflation in the LED, and look at the effect in the circumflex where it goes up from 77 to 0.82. So just a word of caution, if this LED left main combination is severe, that is less than 0.6, then use IBIS. Here's our, our uh, algorithm for left main, single vessel disease, FFR anywhere is good. Distal left main, FFR in both branches is good. Uh, if you have serial lesions in the third scenario, if the FFR across the LED and left main is less than 6, 0.6, use IVUS. And then don't make the mistake as on the bottom, measuring left main FFR without taking into account distal disease. Okay, so that's conundrum number two. We now know what to do with them. How about the non-infarct related artery? That's a big issue. Is a 0.85 trustworthy? So in this occluded LED, we treat the STEMI. Now we want to assess that non-culprit marginal branch. Well, here's the rules, the rules. There's no rules, but if an FFR in any branch anywhere in the circuit is positive, it's true positive. If it's negative, you have to be, your confidence that it's a true negative relies on the fact that it's away from the infarct zone. The further away from the infarct zone, the more confidence you have in that number being true. If you're measuring it in the infarct zone, then you have to wait a couple of days so that zone will stabilize flow. So in the panel on the left, the FFR in that marginal branch uh, overlaps the territory with the infarct zone. I would be careful about accepting that. If it was positive, it's still positive. On the right, the scenario says that the target non-culprit infarct artery is far away from the infarct zone, I would have high confidence in that value. Okay, and here's, here's one of the reasons why the acute coronary syndrome is uh, a cautionary situation. If in the acute phase you have a scar and normal myocardium, 
the flow through the artery, that 75% narrowing, gives you an FFR of 0.84. Now, as that bed heals, and the myocardium now can receive much more flow, the stenosis will be the same, but because the flow is so much higher, the FFR will move along that pressure flow curve upward and produce a lower FFR value, now an ischemic value. So in the acute setting, you may not get the answer you want, but after two, three, or four days, you certainly will get it, even in the target zone. All right, so what do I do about, uh, I finished my stenting of an LED artery, uh, there's other disease, mild in nature, how do I know if I'm done? And uh, who, what are you going to believe? What you see or what you measure? And that's really the question here is, should we be using a focal last moment uh, FFR to tell us whether we're done or not? And I would propose that we probably should be doing pressure pullback so we can characterize all of the disease in the vessel rather than just pick one point and say it's positive or negative. Now, if it's obviously, if it's positive, we have to know whether it's due to focal disease or whether it's due to diffuse disease. So on the left panel here in the LED, you can see an IFR pullback co-registered to the angiogram showing several points of pressure, but no distinct large step up. So this is diffuse disease. And on the right, the pressure pullback through the circumflex artery, which had a stent in the proximal segment, demonstrates that the lesion of importance is way down there at the bottom with a, with a, a low value a lot of those yellow pressure dots, and then no loss of pressure across the proximal stent or left main. So this was the culprit, and we could make a good decision about what to do with this patient. Okay, there is now a, a movement to characterize the diffuse or focal nature using a pressure pullback gradient. Uh, it's a little complicated to give you the derivation in a few seconds, but the bottom line is a high value close to one indicates a focal lesion that is a lot of pressure over a short distance versus uh, lesser pressure over a long distance. That would be a low PPG close to zero. So if you have a high number, it's focal, low number, it's diffuse, and you can characterize and treat based on that pullback. Okay, so that takes us all the way up here to uh, the last part of our discussion on TAVR. I, guess, I don't know if I left it in there, but let's see. No. Okay, so I'm... I stopped with the conundrums of function, but I want to just touch briefly on four studies that were kind of negative for FFR and just briefly give you what the take was. You will recall the flower MI trial told us that there was no benefit from FFR guided PC in non culprit vessels. Well, if you look into that study a little different, there was uh, a lot of uh, unspecified target lesion revascularization. Uh, non-target lesion revascularization, which contributed to endpoints, making this, uh, if you use FFR in every single vessel, you're going to find it doesn't have any value. And that, <coughs> an FFR value greater than 0.8 doesn't need to be treated, yet in this study some were. In the ripcord study, they treated, they assessed every vessel with FFR and in fact made no change in a majority, 60%. And so you have to be selective again about when you're going to use FFR. Systematic application will not provide the clinical benefit it was designed to do. The same could be said about the future study where there was no advantage to FFR guided angio in multivessel disease. And again, in 43% of these patients, they didn't follow what the FFR recommended. And there were some questions in conduct about the management of this, which gave FFR a black eye. Now, the, the last study, FAME 3, was a very good study. It showed that FFR was, FFR guided PCI was not superior to cabbage revascularization. Now, it turns out that most of the FFR in the FAME 3 study had uh, values less than 0.8. So it really wasn't a test of FFR, it was a test of PCI versus cabbage. And we know that in severe disease, as in the uh, syntax trials, bad disease is better with cabbage, mild disease does better with PCI. So when you're, when you're hearing people talk about FFR physiology in a negative light, just keep some of these comments in mind. The future of our physiology world is in angiographically derived data, CT on the left, and 
in-lab angiographic FFR-derived information on the right. Multiple companies have taken this up. This will be what's going to happen to us in the next five years. My lab, I hopefully, looks like this. This is not my lab, but I'm hoping to be able to do a lot of my physiology without having to use a pressure guide wire and incorporate this into my workflow every day. Okay, I'm going to conclude right here. I think in stable ischemic heart disease, physiology beats angiography alone for outcomes. There's really no reason not to measure things where the answer is not clear and certainly to confirm what's happening. It will reduce uh, unnecessary stents and adverse events. In the acute coronary syndrome, again, I think physiology trumps angiography. However, we know that you don't have to treat those vessels in the STEMI patients. For non-STEMIs, I think you can get a good direction on what to do. Shortens hospital stay, reduces costs. I'm gonna skip over coronary microvascular disease, but that is one of the aspects of our future care. And lastly, I think that all of us will welcome an angiographically derived FFR. Its correlate is about 85% of wire-based, but it is certainly our future. And many people who don't have the option to do wire will always have the option to measure angiographically derived FFR if they can afford the uh, software upgrade. So I'm gonna say thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Karn, for your brilliant and outstanding presentation. Actually, we are really happy to have you, and I think Dr. Kalra have some queries regarding uh, some issues, right, Kalra? Hi, Moritz. I love listening to you talk because I learn something Hi. every time. It's nice to see you again. Um, Likewise. I, uh, looking at or enjoying your presentation, a couple of my own cases have come to mind uh, that where the results surprised me, but I think I understand a little bit better now what's gone on. Um, one of those patients was uh, a guy in whom we did hybrid revascularization, who had multivessel disease. Each major lesion was physiologically positive. So there was a physiologically positive lesion in the prox LED, in a ramus, and in the circumflex. And we ended up putting a lima onto his LED. So now he had a dual blood supply to that large territory of myocardium. His circ remained physiologically positive. But when I retested his ramus, after the bypass graft was placed on, his ramus was now negative. And it was clearly negative from a physiologic perspective. So am I to surmise that the, the reason for his negative FFR value in the ramus was because he now had a dual blood supply to the largest bed, and so preferentially there was enough flow that went down the ramus to make that physiology negative, and so it was the right thing to leave it alone? I, I think that assumption uh, is correct. So if you pressurize the LED and it connects in some way to the ramus, and it's not separated, there will be pressurization within the ramus. Now the fact that the bed is being perfused better shouldn't do much to the ramus flow measurement itself, um, although it's a smaller bed. Well, I guess it, so if I understood you, your description, you had three positive arteries, you put a lima on, the circ stayed positive and the ramus became negative. Correct. Right. So I think that means that there was some way that the blood could get from the LED to the ramus because they're all pretty close together at that trifurcation. Yeah, I mean, there was, no, so, there was no distal left main disease, right? So if, if the area beyond the stenosis in the LED was supplied by the lima, then the anagrade flow through the left main, which would have been supplying the entire LED, both pre- and post-stenotic segment in the LED, now yeah. I guess you, you, you know, your pref pressure differential because you've got retrograde flow from the lima, I, I'm thinking must have started to go more down towards the lateral wall vessels because there, was, there just wasn't the same need for supply down the LED right. given the so presence you, of a lima. But you took the I don't LED know. bed out of, the, out of the picture. What's that, sorry? So you, you took the LED bed, yeah. part of the LED bed out it. of the picture. I got it. So, so the, the ramus number went up. The circumflex may not have appreciated that. I got it. So this really underlies the importance of the concept of the size of the myocardial bed as the determinant yes. of whether or not physiologic flow is key. And so... That yes. brings me to my second question, which is sometimes the physiology is, you know, intracoronary physiology using traditional wires is quite difficult to assess in distal vasculature, right? Um, you know, distal vessel lesions. And, you know, depending on whom you speak to, you know, if you spend a minute or two while looking at Twitter and hearing David Brown 
say what he wants to say, whether it's you know valid or not. He screams yeah. at the top of his lungs the distal distal vessel. Of, he he's a big revascularization nihilist, as you know. But but he you know he one of the comments he said a little while ago was that distal vessel disease doesn't need to be treated. Um, and I don't, I, I have trouble getting my head around the idea of what the purpose is of treating proximal vessel disease when the distal vasculature is the point and you have a bunch of distal vessel lesions that maybe you can't directly test the physiology to, but are the gatekeepers to the entire distal bed. So you've identified probably the single biggest conundrum in coronary artery disease. That is, we treat a lot of proximal disease, but we leave a lot of distal disease. Yeah. That Does the myocardium sense. know this? Probably. Does it make, did we make a difference? I'm not sure. Does a bypass that is put on further distal than we're ever going to get mm -hmm. uh, provide benefit over what we do proximally? And the answer is probably yes. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about distal disease, I'm not a fan of small vessel intervention. That is, if it's two millimeters or less, I stay away. I don't think I can get a good result. It might be two millimeters along the course because it is diffuse. So that would say we're not going to do very much unless you put, you know, 100 millimeters of metal. Um, regardless of whatever David Brown says, I think we need to make sense of the physiology. And so measuring a distal uh, FFR way out there to a small bed would give you a higher chance of having a visual functional mismatch. That is perhaps a negative FFR when it looks bad. And then, of course, it could be positive, but there's no focal lesion because that's the effect of diffuse disease. So these are you are insightful in the extreme on this because I think you've identified probably our major problem. By the way, that first case you just described, I would like to see that as a case report. Put one of your fellows to work. Uh, yeah, no problem. We're actually writing it up now because this guy. So that brings me to my third question. This guy has yes. ch had child C cirrhosis. Right, he had, he had yes. true blue child C cirrhosis, and I combined with one of my surgical partners to get him revascularized. He then got a liver transplant three weeks later and has just had his four month follow up and is doing well. So that brings me yeah. to my third question, which is in these systemically vasodilated patients who have drops in their systemic vascular resistance, resistance across their entire vascular bed, what's the validity of hyperemic indices at all? Should we be using non hyperemic? Should we neither be using neither, given that? Ah you know, their cardiac output is 10 at baseline, and so they've got yes. totally dilated microvasculature. Okay, so here's what you might see. You might see high resting flow, and you'd be able to detect a lesion significant at rest. You would see impaired hyperemic flow, uh, but you would still see, uh, you might find a pressure gradient for that condition. And that condition is what he's living with now, but in, in another year, maybe he changes. Yeah. Um, if you were to use coronary flow reserve, you would see all kinds of things change, right? So high resting flow, low hyperemia is low coronary flow reserve. It, if his resting flow is reduced back to normal after his liver transplant, his coronary flow reserve may become normal. So hmm. you were describing dynamic physiology, which will affect the measurements. If you need to treat something, I think you can use what you have because it'll reflect what is going on in its current that's state. Right. Interesting. That's about okay. as good as we're going to do Khan, again. Thank you very thank much. You. Actually, I want to know, you. Yeah, you nicely say. I just got educated. That was great. Our, our philosophy is seeing is believing, but now you're really confused. Actually, you are telling we should believe you or our own eye. What is your well, final comments? We're t if we're talking about an angiogram, there are some significant limitations in understanding blood flow through an angiographic two-dimensional lumen. But you're trained to look at angiograms and you're reflexly trained to treat narrowings. But you have to put the narrowing in context with the clinical scenario, the results of any testing, the uh, risk, benefit, and so on. So. Just relying on the angiogram alone and reflexly stenting every narrowing is a mistake. Thank, thank you, you Martin. I'm requesting Professor Khuddurawan Sir. Thank you, Martin oh. Karn, for your brilliant speech. I am Professor Mir Jamal, um, <coughs> Secretary General of Bangladesh Society of Cardiovascular Intervention. I want to know what is your experience regarding wire free FFR? Regarding wire free FFR. Have you understood? As you what? You have QFR. Is asking me? I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, he's asking you more about QFR. Okay. 
my apologies. So my experience with wire-free FFR is rather limited at the moment. <coughs> CathWorks is, and uh, the, the uh, QFR companies are in line to install their equipment in our lab. But at the moment, I've been to the CathWorks uh, facility and I have a very good understanding of what they do. I think that the correlation to wire FFR and angiographically derived FFR is very good, above 85%. Uh, that's as good as many of our testing results will be. It will be easy to use in the cath lab. It will be obtained by our own angiograms. There is no need to give hyperemic stimuli because it's in, into the computer simulation of computational fluid dynamics. And you'll be able to get an FFR for every vessel in the heart. And you may not be 100% uh, correlated with FFR, but if you have any doubt, you put in a wire. So I think it's going to make a big impact. There are a lot of people who don't like FFR because they don't want to put wires in. So this will be a very big step. Now, it may be a few years before we get this technology. I, I've been waiting a while myself, so I can imagine it's diffusion across the country and across the world might be a little slower. I hope that answers your question. Okay. So Martin, uh, the barman from Cedars and Hakamovich they said the burden of ischemia and severity of ischemia has correlation with the event. So does it work in the uh, flow wire that it is not just binary because the severe the problem with the number, then the problem is more? Yes. So it's interesting that there's a paper by Shin, S-H-I-N, on the breadth and depth of ischemia. So the breath is how over what distance in the artery are you ischemic? You know, what is your diffuse pressure gradient loss? And the depth is how severe is that ischemia, what the FFR number is. And of course, if you have diffuse disease, regardless of what your FFR number is, you have more events. You have the fewest events if you have a normal FFR or a high FFR, and you have the most events if you have both. And then you have intermediate values when you have a mixed response. So you need to uh, take into account the depth and the breadth of your ischemic condition. What is the diffuse nature of the disease? What's the focal nature? How severe is the FFR or the IFR? So the answer is yes. It's not just a lesion and it's not just simply an FFR number. Okay, my apologies we, because we are 30 minutes like behind from our next session. So I would like to introduce our president, Professor Akam Fuduraman, sir, to please bring Professor M. S. Hiramoth in, into the screen and give a kind introduction for the next talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Khan, because you are very well known to us by your book, Handbook of Cardiac Catheterization. And myself is lucky enough, I have met you in Atlanta directly, and our all doctors, they are also lucky enough to see you virtually. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Next talk by Dr. Shiris Hiramath. Dr. Shiris Hiramath is the director of Cath Lab Pune, Bombay. He was the ex-president of CSI, now the program chair of CSI convener of the National International uh, Interventional Council of India, and he has great experience in the peripheral angiography and other interventional procedure, participated in the uh, many conferences at home and abroad. He is one of the important interventional figure in Southeast Asia as well as India and also in my country. I salute uh, Dr. Shiri Siamot. I am lucky enough that I can got training on intervention, and I start my journey on intervention under his uh, guidance. So I salute him. Please, Dr. Shiris Hiramat. Thank you, Dr. Raman, and uh, good morning, everybody. Actually, I'm in California right now, so it's about seven in the evening, and uh, we are going to be talking on uh, a complex PCI, and we will go through some cases. Uh, when we talk of uh, complex PCI, uh, uh, let's take a look at this uh, particular case. This lady was put on Recording treadmill. in progress. And uh, she had positive response, strong positive response, less than a minute. Um, so she came for an angiogram, and you can see the RCA or shim. Critically, 
parties than just a dominant vessel. The left main is really a long length, uh, so it's something like 60 meters. And not that, uh, there is a disease which we'll see in some other angles. But uh, 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 the, the other issues where she's diabetic for almost 10 years and creatinine is uh, raised. Uh, so we have to be very careful as to what we are going to do, whether we are going to do everything in one sitting or do uh, two different settings, one for left, one for right artery. So here to save on contrast and get good support, uh, we have uh, instead of uh, JR, which was used for uh, diagnostic angio, we have an AL catheter. And uh, we purposely chose a uh, uh, hydrophilic wire so that the wire can move in very quickly and we can save on contrast. That was one very important. Uh, second question is why we are doing right first when there is so much disease in the left artery. Uh, it is probably to achieve some respect of stability when we are doing left. Uh, this lady had a treadmill positive inside uh, second on at stage one. So obviously there was amount of ischemia. Uh, fortunately, the left ventricle was pretty normal. This is a balloon dilatation, and then we come in with a stent uh, 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 from the RCA Orsium. And uh, uh, the stent was uh, stretched with an NC balloon. And this is the final result. Obviously, we keep the few struts of the stent back in the aorta to cover the beginning of the RCA. Once we achieve this, I think we are a lot happy in the sense patient would probably be far more stable. So you can see the RCA is a very dominant vessel. And distality, there is there are no lesions at all. So then, uh, uh, having achieved a good result here, uh, the patient was also hemodynamically more stable. So we go to the left, and here we have uh, uh, a long left main, uh, and you can see uh, the circumflex ostium uh, is uh, uh, critically narrowed. Uh, close to 99% with very little flow. However, it's a good size circulation. You can see in spider view a long left main, which was quite long. So since the creatinine was high, we decided we will choose one view which will show us most of the lesions. So though we, this is one way in which you can limit your contrast injection. And uh, this we chose uh, 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 light RAO with a steep cranial angle and we kept working in this all the time so that we don't have to uh, look at the uh, uh, contrast injection in it. Here we find a very, very critical narrowing uh, of the circumflex after the original OM1 branch. This was probably 99% and could possibly the reason for ongoing in Vienna. In addition, uh, the uh, ramus or a high diagonal is showing a critical disease with disease in the mid segment of the leg. So we said we will use this image as a frame on which we will base our strategy and go further. Uh, um, as we said earlier, we wanted to save on contrast. And here, that's why we used a filter XT wire, which we thought would slip in uh, and we can limit on contrast. So filter XT wire is sent to uh, uh, OM1 first. Uh, you can see a micro catheter just at this point where the uh, circumflex is going up. You withdraw the wire filter XT from the OM1 and place it into the circumflex as you can see here. Once this was placed, uh, we decided we would use, uh, see we intentionally chose hydrophilic wire because we wanted to limit on contrast. 
So there is a hyperport going to LED, the first picture. Then we have the another hyperport going to OM1 branch. So all three wires in, are in position. It circumflex the OM1 and the LED. Uh, at this stage, uh, uh, we decided we will extend the mid LED region. So balloon to mid LED, stent to mid LED. In the stent, of course, we kept it away from any bifurcation. Stent is entirely paced beyond all the complexity of the buffer. And uh, so this tent deployed here in the mid LED, uh, high pressure inflation was done. And uh, now we are looking at the uh, circumflex. So here you can see a balloon dilatation, the microcatheter brought in a little bit. And uh, we generally, when we are doing, we chose a, a, a strategy where we want to address both main branch as a side branch. Uh, uh, so this is the mini crush technique. And uh, uh, balloon dilatation to circumflex with the microcatheter. A uh, wire is already there in the OM1 branch. Uh, after doing balloon dilatation, we bring in a stent which slips in quite easily. And then we thought uh, as a strategy for mini crush, we would bring in a stent to the uh, on OM1 branch. However, uh, we could get uh, a stent sizably inside, but because of the bends, this was not going any further. So we had to uh, sort of uh, uh, struggle a lot uh, this was supported by the, the micro uh, However, just not go further. So we did repeat that, it, yet it did not go. So we, uh, we drew uh, the stent which would have gone into OM1 branch and then dilated the uh, uh, into the circumflex tent. The back end, of course, had to be positioned very carefully, uh, matching with the wire position. Uh, so we have one stent in the mid LED, which is dependent. Then the second stent is now in the uh, circumflex uh, after the origin of OM1 branch. And uh, then uh, we remove the wire and then bring in the stand to the one. So here the stand slips in very easily. Uh, we had to be very sure that the back end of the first stand going toward the next uh, would match the stand in the uh, OM1 branch. OM1 branch, the back end is kept at the origin of the uh, circumflex vessel. Uh, this stand is deployed. We always like to bring back the balloon a little bit and go high pressure. We always do that so that uh, it makes balloons don't go easily. We are we done at least an extent a high pressure inflation. So this was the stent uh, strategy, the circumflex stent starting from the uh, origin of the OM1 branch. Um, then a mini crush technique with a third stent. Uh, going to the OM1 branch. So this was mini crush. Uh, you know, we are of course withdrawing the wire because uh, this patient was extremely unstable and uh, we didn't want to sort of waste time doing uh, the, the case and high pressure inflation at this stage. Uh, so we wanted to get it flows first. That was the principle. So once we did this, uh, uh, we had a good uh, a stent in LED, good stent flow in the circumflex and good flows in the uh, OM1 branch. We now decide to uh, come to the, um, uh, the first branch of, let's call it a D1. And, uh, 
uh, branch was then wired. The energy was also again wired. And so we are going for a bifurcation at this particular point. So uh, this is pre dissertation NC then a stent is brought into the diagonal branch. Uh, another stent is brought from uh, mid portion of the uh, left wing uh, to touch the stent which was already deployed. And this was a, a four millimeter stent. Uh, and so this was the final position, a mini crush again between uh, uh, the diagonal one with uh, stent going from left main to LAT. And stent was deployed as usual. We pull the balloon back and go high on pressure uh, so that we are trying to avoid a possible dissection at the distal end. And uh, this is the contrast showing uh, uh, force flows through four stents which are deployed LAT, the circumflex, the OM1 and the diagonal. I think the flows look quite So we are quite happy uh, at this stage and ready to deploy the stent, which is going from left main uh, to uh, uh, the deployed LED stent. Must make sure that the overlap is quite correct. It was uh, then deployed. At this stage, you can see all the stents on roscopy here. Uh, we are doing a pot, uh, and for pot, we always like to keep about six to eight meters uh, length in the proximal portion uh, so that the stand balloon can fit inside the metal and we go very high pressure. So, this was done. Uh, you can see all the five stands uh, uh, here, and uh, this is the pot, and then we are now going to go for application. So what we have achieved is uh, got the one in right and five in left. And those are normal. The patient was very stable. Otherwise, for every little uh, uh, inflation, a uh, patient used to get severe pain, process depression, and hypotension. Uh, so we now uh, the wire in the diagonal, uh, do uh, NC balloon dilatation to the deployed LED stains, and then do a kiss between uh, a diagonal and LED, uh, LED stain, and thus uh, high pressure uh, inflation sweat. Uh, once we did that, uh, we switched the wire to uh, the OM1 branch and did another. Uh, kissing uh, dilatation uh, with the uh, uh, left main LED stand and then uh, making sure that there is no uh, problem at the distality of any of these stands, uh, we could withdraw the wire from OM1. Uh, this is the lesion um, at the bifurcation uh, which we did not address with uh, uh, kissing because I think uh, taking wire through this was getting very difficult and we did not want to disrupt a uh, nice thing in one branch. Uh, then we do a final pot or repot. This is the uh, position. And so you can see the final analysis of uh, course, through all my stand uh, on, on the left side uh, are looking very good. And this is uh, despite a very long left main, 16 long main, uh, generally a worry for an angioplasty. Uh, so you could see here uh, the uh, three lesions in the left system. Uh, this is the way the stents are placed and you can see nice flows in all the stents. So we kept using this angle and occasionally an area of mostly for distal wiring 
turbo flex and pistol wiring into LED. And so this was our final results on this patient. Uh, so all stains were placed as a mini crush technique. Uh, as I mentioned to you, we wanted to save time and contrast with creating a eye. And this is our final uh, position on the RCA first. You can see a very big dominant circulation. So once you st achieve stability with this kind of circulation getting normalized, uh, you can play around about the complexity of the left side. This is a uh, second case I want to show you. I mean, uh, 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 this patient was actually placed for surgery uh, because he had uh, grade three mitral Professor Hiramath, I, I apologize. I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up in about 30 seconds because we have a live case waiting. All right. This was the uh, uh, trifurcation, including a disease, the uh, distality of the left vein. Uh, so the plan was to place the side branch stents first. Uh, this patient was going with the Jana for almost six months. Every time we EF because of mitral research. So uh, uh, we actually used a, a, a PA catheter to monitor the PA pressure, a long sheet, a balloon pump, and a, a seven French EBU catheter. So we uh, placed the first stent. We did a rota, but there was calcium at the left main. Uh, and, uh, we use Fielder XT first because it's quick win exchange over micro -cathed. Thank you, Professor. We're going to have to ask you to move to your summary slide, unfortunately, because we are really out of time. Okay. So this is our final picture on this uh, patient. Uh, we did a part and final close like this. Uh, three stands at the bifurcation. And uh, this patient has six months very well uh, going up on his activity on a regular basis. Thank you indeed for this. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, our life case started at least 45 years ago. So, at my sincere apologies to Dr. Sharma. Please, you, you with us, only to 15 minutes or 10 minutes, we are come back from the life case. If you don't mind, then we can go for the life case. Yeah, hi, good morning. I, uh, yeah. If you're going to take a couple of minutes, I'll wait, no problem. Uh, if you just have to go if and you have back, any emergency, so wait. that you can actually, if you have any emergency, I, I heard you have an yeah, I have another case surgeon, to huh? operate myself, so. Okay, uh, so, so I, you just, I think, uh, you, you just start, try to make it very short and small and brief, so I will be happy. Okay, can you share your screen? Yes, so thank you very much for accommodating and uh, uh, I'll, uh, I think I can skip the brief introduction and I can try to finish it as soon as I can. I'm going to talk about uh, management of heart failure beyond ejection fraction. Uh, basically, I don't need this adult audience to be uh, sharing the classification and definition. So I'll skip to what I'm going to touch upon in terms of SGLT2 and why it's an important intervention for a cardiologist who does intervention because this is one of the intervention that changes mortality. I mean, and I, I don't see between two stents, if you can define that, if any two stents, uh, when compared, one would give you better mortality outcomes as compared to other. But this is one therapy, if you have intervened, irrespective of the class of heart failure, is going to work. I'm going to touch upon all the three important trials. Very important fear that people have is that empagliflozin or SGLT2 in a non-diabetic patient can induce hypoglycemia, which is not the case because glycosuria is proportionate to what amount of sugars are there So uh, in the serum. So glycosuria within 24 hours of single dose is not going to exceed 40 to 50 grams of glucose. Uh, uh, within 24 hours as compared to diabetics where it is much more and this is driven primarily by the renal thresholds. The plasma glucose levels also don't change that drastically in di non-diabetic patients and primarily the therapy is uh, proposed because of its 
through multiple actions, again, which are beyond the discussion today. So I'm going to touch upon and take you through the all the class of a spectrum of heart failure. And also we look at the acute heart failure. We all know about Emperor Reduced, which was one of the most important trials, which looked at the reduced ejection fraction outcome patients with ampaglifosin versus the standard care therapy. And it resulted into 25% relative risk reduction with the first day of significance achieved within 12 days. I don't see any other therapy, including therapies like uh, CRTs that can give you results as early as 12 days in patients with chronic heart failure. And that's one reason why interventionists should also be about, uh, aware about intervention like a therapy with an SGLT2, which can bring down an absolute risk reduction by 5.2% with only 19 patients needed to be treated for the same. And of course, remember this therapy was effective irrespective of baseline diabetic or non-diabetic. It also lowers the risk in patients with reduced ejection fraction for end-stage kidney disease, which is one of the important aspects of mortality with almost 50% relative risk reduction. In patients with preserved ejection fraction, even when you compare the Emperor Preserve trial with the ejection fraction for the 40%, also showed that the CV death and hospitalization for heart failure was reduced significantly by almost 29%. Uh, in terms of mid-range and by 17% in preserved ejection fraction, again, irrespective whether the patient was diabetic or not. The risk of hypoglycemia or ketoacidosis in or with or without diabetes was as good as placebo. So it doesn't cause any side effect profile in terms of comparison with the what you we expect as an anti-diabetic therapy. So Emperor Preserved is one therapy which has shown risk reduction by 21% and CV death and heart failure hospitalization are significantly reduced as compared to other trials like Paragon, TopCat, iPreserve, PAPHF or Charm Preserve where some of them actually did not have significant value reduction in terms of statistical significance. Now, when you look at this now plotted across the ejection fraction, in patients with reduced ejection fraction, you have net number to treat only 19, in mid-range only 21, and preserved only 42 to have a significant even reduction. And this is the pooled emperor data across the spectrum. So this goes on to prove that in a patient with chronic heart failure, across the spectrum of ejection fraction, every patient can be given uh, empagliflozin. Uh, Jardians is indicated to reduce the risk of CV death and hospitalization in adults as class one indication. What about acute heart failure? Uh, we know that in, even in the Indian data set that we had from CSI Kerala Heart Failure Acute Registry, patients who were on guideline-directed therapy compared to those who were not, not the in-hospital mortality compared, uh, uh, continued to be pretty high, 7% versus 90-day mortality of 11.6%, re-hospitalization of 11%. And the reason for deviation was often believed the worsening of kidney failure, hyperkalemia, or uh, hypotension. So Empulse was primarily looking at for post-acute heart failure, where they looked at the evaluation with a win ratio defined as a composite of death, number of heart failure events, time to visit a first heart failure, hospitalization, and the KCCQTSS score at 90 days. So all of these criteria must apply for the inclusion was required and the patient's blood pressure was more than 60, uh, more than 100 for more than six hours, no increase in diuretic dosages and IV, no vasodilator, including nitrate within the last six hours, and no inotrope in the last 24 hours. And they looked at the uh, all-cause mortality in heart failure hospitalization, and you can see the benefit was consistent in acute heart failure onset, de novo or chronic, whether EF was less than 40 or more than 40, whether the patient was diabetic or not, and the adverse events were pretty much matching for the placebo arm. So when you compare this with the various other trials, like Soloist, where the cetagliflozin was looked, Galactic, where even active uh, Macarbil was evaluated, Victoria, where Verisigua was evaluated, Pioneer HF, where Arpani was evaluated, Impulse is the only trial of uh, the therapy where all the it met all the criteria. Reduced ejection fraction, preserved ejection fraction, diabetic, non-diabetic, and 100% patients were initiated this during in-hospitalization. So optimizing the place in heart failure therapy would hence mean the four pillars. The four pillars when you combine the RNA beta blocker, MR, and SGLT2, the hazards goes down by 64%, uh, it hazards is just 0.36, as compared to say Verisigua, where it's not that much down. So this, even Omactive Macarbil or uh, Verisigua combination with MRA, all these trials uh, have been superseded with fantastic results with these classical four foundational pillars as the ACC talks about, beta blocker, SGLT2, RNA and MRA. So you need to just ensure EGFR is more than 30. 
and the E for DAPA and more than 20 for AMPA for the initiation. The 2022 strongest recommendation that has now come as 2A in patients with mid-range ejection fraction also as GLT-2 is beneficial in reducing the heart failure, hospitalization and CD mortality. Uh, Milton Packers Group has suggested combining beta blocker as GLT-2 ahead of ARNI and this is when you're going in a stepway fashion but in our part of the world I assume a lot of patients may not be able to come back to you uh, every weekly for up titration in three steps. Very often in our practice, we do uh, initiate three or maybe all four of them if the blood pressure and the clinical hemostasis, uh, hemodynamics and potassium hemostasis and renal functions are good enough. So patient-centric favoring and tailoring of the therapy is important. And this is a position statement from Heart Failure Association of European Society of Cardiology. Patients with hypotension increase heart rate or either of those combinations that you can see on the right side, on the left side of your screen, SGLT2 should be given to all of them. So you may have other therapies coming in and going out, but the SGLT2 has remained a pillar, irrespective of heart rate, blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, hypotension, CKD, pre-discharge, post-discharge, all of them can actually be given SGLT2, uh, irrespective whether you can give other therapies or not. And this is a position statement from Heart Failure Association of European Society. The advantage of Jardians being that it needs no titration, there is nothing to do with the heart rate, nothing to do with blood pressure, nothing absolutely to do with sugar. You can leave your anti-diabetic management therapies to be tailored by our diabetologist friend, but I believe all interventionists should insist to intervene with this therapy, being single, dose, or once daily, no titration. Thank you very much. I hope I stuck to the time. It was an excellent lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma.